We like to think of Buddhist wisdom as something subtle and abstract. And there are aspects of the Buddhist teachings that are subtle and abstract. But wisdom has to start with some very basic things. You might call it wisdom for dummies. There are two ways in which the Buddha talks about very basic levels of wisdom. You're not going to get to the higher levels until you've mastered the basics. One is if you see there's something that you like to do, but it's going to give bad results. You know how to talk yourself out of it. The other is if you see something that you don't like to do that's going to give good results, you're going to talk, you'll be able to talk yourself into it. In other words, you learn how to psych yourself out. You learn to look at the long term rather than the short term and try to figure out what the problem is, how you can get around laziness. We were talking this afternoon about laziness, about getting up in the morning. There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about the different excuses people give for laziness. I didn't get enough sleep last night. I'm tired. I worked yesterday. I'm going to be working tomorrow. I'm, I came back from a trip yesterday. I'm going on a trip tomorrow. I've been sick. And then he compares that with the reasons that a, another person might give for being more energetic in the practice. And it turns out they're the same reasons. I worked a lot yesterday, but now I've got a chance to meditate today. I'm going to be working tomorrow, but I've got this chance to meditate now. I've been sick. Well, finally I've gotten over that. I can meditate some. I may still be weak, but the illness could come back, so here's my chance. In other words, the objective situation is not different. It's your attitude. And if the voice is to get you more energetic or not there, we'll try to learn some of them. Because you're not the only one who likes to, to sleep sleep in late. Everybody likes to sleep in late. And John Mahabhu complained about how he was a lazy person. And here was someone who would, could sit you know, five, six hours as if it were nothing, eventually. We all have to figure out some way to get around our laziness. At the same time, there are things that we like to do. We have to learn how to say no. Learn how to see the drawbacks of those things. And at the very least, put up a fight. All too often the voices in the mind say, you're going to be giving in anyhow. So why don't you give in now? And we don't have to waste a lot of time and energy. And you can respond, say, well, I don't know about five minutes from now, but right now I'm responsible for right now. So if it's something that I should do, I'm going to do it now. If it's something I shouldn't do, I'll, I won't be doing it now. We'll talk about five minutes down the line later. Because that's another one of the things they talk about. They'll say, you get up and meditate, you're not going to last very long, so why bother? So at least I get up, get in the position, and then we'll talk from there. It's not like you're committed. Once you get up, then have to meditate. But you say, well, at least give, us, give it a try. The same when you find yourself doing something you shouldn't be doing, you've started doing it, and you, part of the mind will say, well, now that you've started, you're committed, you might as well go all the way. You say, nope, I can stop. So learn how to psych yourself out. It's all very simple. But the problem is you tend to identify with certain voices in the mind. And you've got to learn how to pull away that sense of identification. Learn to see them as not-self. And we like to think of the not-self teaching as something very abstract and subtle. But it's something we're doing all the time. We're not-selfing all the time in order to self new things. You self with an idea, and then another idea comes up. So you not-self the first idea, and then you self the second idea. Learn to be a little bit more systematic about that. Learn to view your sense of self and the activity of not-selfing as tools.
and ask yourself, when is it useful to identify with this idea, and when is it useful to identify with that idea, and you have the freedom. Selfing is a verb. It's an activity. It's a kind of karma. And as with all kinds of karma, it's the question, when is it skillful, when is it not skillful? So give yourself a little more freedom around this. The idea that you're committed to being a certain way, that gets in the way of the practice. If everybody committed to being the way they already were, the Buddha wouldn't have bothered teaching. It wouldn't have served any purpose at all. But he saw that we can train ourselves. Part of the mind can train the rest of the mind. And it's simply a matter of getting that, the good part of mind, the part that really does wish for your true well-being. Give that more power. It's one of the reasons why when we meditate we work with the breath to give it a sense of well-being. That part of the mind that needs help. And it gives the rest of the mind a sense of well-being as well. And give the whole body a sense of well-being. So the next time you think about meditating, you'll have a good association with it. You remember that once you make the effort of settling in, it feels really, really good. That becomes your incentive to get up early the next morning, try it again. The other basic area that the Buddha talks about is when things go wrong, things don't go well in life, you learn to give yourself pep talks. And this can apply to the meditation. There are going to be barren stretches in the meditation for everybody. It's common. There are times at the beginning when things are opening up inside, all kinds of new interesting things are happening. Then it levels out, and you're stuck with the same old thing over and over again. Well, learn how to see that maybe there's something else going on in the mind that you're not seeing right now. Sometimes the mind makes some progress and then it has to fill in. It makes a quick sketch and then it has to fill in the rest of the sketch, and that's going to take time. I had a Thai friend who was an artist, and he would do some large traditional Thai paintings. He was working on one of Rama, and his wife came into the studio one afternoon. She, and He'd been working for hours on little tiny details. And she looked at the painting and she said, Oh, you didn't get much done today, did you? And he said, I've been working all day. So the parts of the mind that have to fill in the details before you're, before you're going to be able to move on. So learn how to keep yourself in a good mood in the meantime. Maybe the results aren't coming as quickly as possible, or the changes aren't coming as quickly as you'd like. But just keep with it, keep with it, keep with it. Think of the Shackleton expedition. They lost their ship. They're down near Antarctica. Help was, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. It looked pretty hopeless. But the captain gave them good pep talks, and he looked after everybody, and made sure that everybody did what they could. They'd all learned, this is what you have to do in a situation like this. And so he made sure that everybody did that. He said, at the very least, if, if we die, at least we'll know we're not going to die from our own carelessness or our own laziness. If we die in doing our duty, okay, it's an honorable death. And they made their way out. So as you're meditating, you're not going to die. From the meditating, but at the very least, say, I'm going to do it well. I'm going to stick with the steps. And oftentimes, when pro progress is not happening, it's because you're getting sloppy in the details. So go back and think about step one, step two, step three. And don't think that it's embarrassing to go back to step one, two, or three. And John Lee's images of a path that you walk back and forth, back and forth, back and forth many times. He says, one, the the path gets worn smooth, and two, you see little details you wouldn't have seen if you just walked through it once. Again, a lot of this has to do with the fact that the mind is a complex thing. And sometimes you have to go over the same things again and again and again to see all the implications. So that's another basic wisdom or wisdom for dummies. 
Of course, it's not going to keep you a dummy. In fact, it's, this is the kind of wisdom that gets you out of being a dummy. The dummies are the ones who want to learn all about emptiness and dependent core rising all at once without having the, the foundation. Because all they get are perceptions, labels in the mind. But they don't actually see where these teachings are useful and why they are useful tools. The Buddha didn't teach these things just to show off how smart he was. Everything he taught was for a purpose. And when your mind is ready, then you see, oh, this serves that purpose. Again, with the John Lee. He talks about people who want to get gold out of, out of the rock, and they see somebody taking a big pickaxe and carrying big loads of rock back to the smelter, and they say, that's dumb. Who wants all that rock? All you want is the gold. So they're going to take a little tiny pickaxe and just get all the gold right out of the rock. It doesn't work that way. You have to take the rock and you have to put it in the smelter and subject it to heat, and then the metals will come melting out at their own, in their own accord. So there's a lot in the meditation that you can't anticipate. You can't plan too far ahead. But you know, these are the steps. We're lucky that we have them laid out for us. And John Lee's seven steps in his method too. There's something going wrong in your meditation? Okay, look and see which one of the steps you're not getting right, or which one you're getting sloppy about. And you just keep doing it again and again and again. Give yourself pep talks. It's like any any manual skill that has a lot of repetitive stuff, like sharpening a knife. When you're sharpening a knife, you have to be alert. You have to be very sensitive to make sure that you're not ruining the blade or making some parts too sharp or wearing down some parts too much and others not enough. It has to be very even and smooth. And so you have to give yourself pep talks as you're sitting there rubbing the the blade over the stone, over the stone, over the stone, again and again and again. And if you keep your spirits up, you find that you can make your way through and do the job well. This may be one of the reasons why the Ajans are old and the Zen masters would have you learn a manual skill before you meditated, because of the qualities of mind that go into mastering a skill are precisely the qualities of mind that you need to meditate. They're basic not because they're dumb. They're basic because they're important. They're essential to everything else. Here's that teaching on learning how to put long-term ahead of short-term. That's the essence of wisdom. Teaching on how to not let things get you down. That's what's going to help you see your way all the way through.